Morning guys, Dr. Ken Norberg here with another fireside hunting seminar. Uh, kind of an exciting talk today, a prelude to deer hunting. I'm going to talk about what bucks are up to right now. One of the most important parts of their lives begins today or tomorrow or the day after that. Yeah, we're right there at that beginning. From that time on until the end of the second week in January, everything antler bucks do has something to do with breeding, believe it or not. You know, people talk about hunting during the rut, and they are thinking the rut is a time when, when does breed. No, and that's a two-week period, as the one in, in November to start with. But actually, there are three of those periods. Another one beginning about December 1st, and another one beginning a few days before January 1st, and extending into the first week or so of January. That's three times. Now, 85% of those are bred during the first period, 10% during the second, and 5% approximately during the third. So, there's that. But there's all kinds of other things related to those breeding periods that bucks are involved with, like one beginning in just a few days. Very, you know, today is the 25th of August. Now, back all beginning in July, but the testosterone, the male sex hormone, well, more than just sex hormone, but it's important to big bucks. The hormone uh, testosterone starts to increase in levels in their bloodstreams, getting up there higher and higher. And by the first of September, it's getting pretty high. It's what makes bucks aggressive toward one another. It makes them want to battle with each other, spar and battle. Now, let's talk about around the first, you know, plus or minus two, three days. And that period is when Bucks all across America are going to be shedding velvet. Now, velvet is a thick kind of funny, it feels like felt on the outside. Uh, they call it velvet because I suppose it feels like velvet when you touch it. I've touched velvet many times on bucks. But it's, and it's kind of firm on the outside. But by, right now, the, the Antlers of all bucks are fully formed. They're fully calcified. They aren't going to get any bigger or any stronger. They're, they're already all done forming. They're completely formed now from this point on. Now, right, right about now or maybe a few days ago, the blood flow, when that happens, the blood flow to that velvet, and it's rich with blood vessels, that carries all the minerals and everything. You've, and, you know, the uh, antler style kind of rubbery and, and easily bent and broken and that kind of thing underneath the velvet. And in time, calcium being carried to those forming antlers, the calcium makes them hard like bone, really dense bone. Okay, so now the blood flow is shut down. It's probably shut down on all bucks, antler bucks in America today. It's shut down. Now, when that, no, that just, it still has feeling. It's kind of like having a toothache. <laughs> you know, you get a bad toothache, uh, and uh, you can have that, you know, something happened to the pulp, the, the herb tissue inside the tooth. Something happened to it, so it's dying. You know, it became infected, and it's dying. And, uh, and though that's not functional anymore, and, uh, that, and it even doesn't have any blood flow anymore, you still get a lot of pain there for a while until the dentist helps you get, get rid of that problem. You know, with bucks, it's that way. You know, that blood flow shuts down, but there's still a lot of feeling in that. And, but one of the problems with it shutting down like that, that tissue, that velvet starts to rot and it starts to stink, you know, like rotting meat. <laughs> it stinks. And it's attracting insects that love to eat meat, especially hornets and uh, yellow jackets and, and flies, certain flies. Oh, they like to eat rotting meat, lay their eggs in it, that kind of thing. So 
it's being attracted to the bucks, and right now those bucks are out there in the woods, and while they're moving around, they may not notice it so much, but when they lay down there in their bed in here, and they're just laying there, here's these doggone yellow jackets, but landing on their, on their velvet, and they're boring their way through the outer coat of, of it to get at that, that meat tissue underneath. And that hurts. <laughs> and that really bugs these bucks. Oh, I hate this, you know. And this goes on for a few days, they, you know, because it, because it has feeling, they're kind of reluctant to do anything about it. But finally, you know, the smell is getting worse and the, the cloud of insects going after this deteriorating velvet is getting worse and they just can't stand it anymore. They'll jump up, run over to a, maybe a little woody bush, you know, woody stems out, or a little tree, small diameter. They want to small diameter because they got to get down into those angles between the antlers, you know, all these little small places. And they want to get rid of that velvet as quick as they can. Because they, they don't want this pain or this problem, this stink, and all these insects bother them anymore. Get rid of them. So they'll go to that and they'll just start pushing and shoving and scraping every which way they can to try to get all that velvet off as quickly as possible. And you, you'll see a photo here of some velvet that was just rubbed off. There's a bloody tissue there at the base of this little woody bush. <laughs> and you see what it looks like when, they're, when that, that velvet is first rubbed off. And then you, you see another picture here of a buck. He finally gave up. He thought, well, there, that's pretty good. He couldn't see up back there how well he did. And he said, there, that's pretty good. But no, there's doggone bugs are still bothering. And you see why? Because, gee, here's tatters and patches of tissue still on his antlers and he missed. And it's going to take that buck two, three days, you know, rubbing on a little tree, little trees, maybe the one he started with or the bush he started with. And, and he's going to rub on there and, and keep working on it until gradually he finally it's all gone. And then one of the finishing touches is he'll go over to some deep grass, you know, or some branches that are hanging down, lots of leaves on little twig parts out on the ends like that, and he'll sweep his antlers back and forth in there to help wipe off what's left of the tatters of velvet on his antlers. And finally it's all gone, and finally he can lay down. <sighs> no more, no more oh, yellow jackets, the hornets bothering him there. He's, can sit there and boy, this is really great. So he's looking for it, but it'll take him two, three days to get it to that point. Now that process opens the door to this four and a half, almost four and a half month period of things that are related to breeding going on. And there's five different phases of, of those things related to breeding all during this period. And during each one of those phases, the buck is going to be doing something different than he did in, in the other four phases. So it keeps changing. And what he does what, creates deer science that tell you, oh, this phase of the rut is now in process. And, or, oh, there, now this phase is in process, and that sort of thing. And if you know that this is happening, these different phases, and you recognize the signs that tell you when this is happening, it's going to greatly improve your buck hunting, as you might well imagine. I mean, what an advantage that is to be able to recognize these phases and know what the buck is doing during each of those phases throughout a hunting season. So, that's the beginning, right now. He shed his velvet. Now, you know, for a lot of bucks, now farm bucks, you know, where there are no wolves, they might not, it might not be a big deal because, you know, they, they've been more freely going out in different fields to feed and walking back and forth without much concern, but up where I hunt, there's a lot of wolves. And wolves don't just hunt them a certain time of the year, they hunt them year-round. And, uh, and they're fawns <laughs> all summer long. But anyway, this is going on, uh, been going on all year round up to this point. So this buck that just shed all his velvet 
has been sticking close to a hideaway, a place away from well-used trails, deer trails or otherwise, way back in thick cover. So there aren't natural trails with odors of a deer recently passing them leading into this area where this buck has been bedding all summer long. Well, from uh, early uh, May until uh, last part of April until around September 1st. He's been hiding, so he doesn't want to, the reason he's been hiding is all during his time, he doesn't want to have to run headlong away from a wolf or a bear because when he's doing that, he can't be careful about uh, banging his velvet into branches along the way. And uh, if that happens, it might tear a hole in his velvet, and when he tears a hole in the velvet, that part of his antler will not develop properly. And it might be a disadvantage when the time comes to battle with other bucks for gaining dominance. Now, one of the first things a buck will do on shedding velvet is he's actually get out and explore his range. You know, if this was a dominant buck the year before, you know, he's he's been boss buck for a square mile or so around the area where he lives. And he's actually get out there and see what's going on and visit all the does and all the fawns and all the yearling does, because they're going to breed as yearlings. Uh, he wants to find all those and what other bucks are living, you know, a big dominant buck will usually allow a few other older antler bucks, two and a half to uh, six and a half years to, of age to live on his range, uh, usually in uh, maybe uh, three to four or five other bucks, mature bucks to live on his range and they live on smaller range and all their ranges overlap with one another and and, and encompass doe ranges all through the square mile and there probably will be four or five does living there with their young and as well. So there's all, he wants to go around and see all these deer. And he's, at this point already, he's thinking about does that are going to be breeding. And it's still a long ways away from that. But he wants to know where they all are feeding and all those things and where these other bucks are and that kind of thing. And some of those bucks might even be ones that are anxious to chase that big boss buck out of there and become the new boss buck of the area. That, that happens. And, well, it actually, actually happens almost every year. Uh, not in every square mile, but maybe in this one this year and that one the next year and that one the next year and that kind of thing. So, because most in, in the wild, most wild bucks seldom survive past their seventh winter. They, they die of natural causes. Well, that's so natural, I guess, when you come to think of it. Uh, it might be because they're just old, they have arthritis, they're unable to run fast enough to keep away from wolves and, and that kind of thing. So, and in, in our country, they become wolf food during that seventh winter. And they wear down their teeth and, and they're unable to eat properly and all that kind of thing. Well, there's so many reasons, but but anyway, here we are, it's first time we want to explore. What if I look at all the trail deer trails and snip all those all the odors and the individual trail sense of individual deer, which identify those different different deer. And you can tell which one he's which one has makes you know, every deer has little different odors, like humans. And he can have said, oh, that's that doe, and she has this fawn, spotted fawn, and whatnot. And, and other bucks, you know, and how big they are, and, and possible challengers, and that kind of thing, all through his range. So now I know it. You know, uh, my son John and his family were returning from a trip out west, out to uh, Utah. <laughs> And they're coming back, and they saw spotted three really big white-tailed bucks and near spearfish in South Dakota on the way back. Three big ones. That's you know here was a case of three big bucks feeding together. Well, that that's not common now. Even before they shed velvet, you know there's three to five mature bucks living in the same And bucks kind of tend to be in the bachelor groups while while breeding is not occurring. You know like in the winter. 
when they're in these wintering areas, the bucks will be in one area and the doe and their young in another area. <laughs> That's pretty common. It probably would be fairly common to see more than one buck feeding together even before they'd shed velvet. So that, that's normal. I expect that. But they'll still have velvet on. You know, and these did. The ones he saw still have velvet on. So that's a normal thing. Well, soon after shedding, one of the first things all these antler bucks do, uh, including yearlings, they'll get involved with this as well. They'll all get together to feed every day, twice a day. In the morning, evening, they'll get together in certain feeding areas and it'll be where there's grains, it's kind of open, you know, green grasses and farm fields and that kind of thing. And uh, there, there could be as many as six together, uh, come together to feed in one these little patches in different places every day. And generally when they first get there, they want to eat. And they're all there eating. And, but later, you know, you get toward the end of a feeding cycle, you know, like getting to be around 10 o'clock in the morning or after dark in the evening, maybe 9 or 10 o'clock at night, uh, they're starting to look at each other like, uh, uh, you know, let's fight. <laughs> you know, I want to know if I'm tougher than you. And you know, one of the strangest things is that yearling bucks are especially that way. They want to battle with everybody. Oh, they got antlers now and they can't wait to use them on another deer. And they'll come up to a big buck on the last plank, you know, and they'll you know, challenge by coming up and clicking antlers. And when they touch antlers, they are going to fight right away. Clickety click, click. <laughs> and usually early during this time, like throughout the month of September, that battling won't be real serious. But it'll happen often, you know. And a big buck, you know, a year like comes up and doesn't go and he'll just shove back and push that thing back where that yearling buck will go rolling and jump away, <laughs> get away from that big monster. He has no chance with that one. And progressively larger bucks they all want to fight with one another. And they, by doing this, they establish a pecking order, uh, a square mile <laughs> pecking order of mature bucks from the bottom. Uh, the bottom ones at the pecking order are, are the yearlings and then progressively larger. And the two largest, you know, they might be the same age. They might be four and a half, six and a half. Usually a, a buck is a dominant breeding buck by age four and a half, sometimes three and a half, depending on how aggressive it is and how big its antlers are, antlers are and things like that. Aggressiveness is an important part of this. That testosterone going up in their blood makes them more and more aggressive. But anyway, they're testing each other every twice a day uh, out there in these areas where they come together feeding. And you're going to see a picture here of six bucks, six antler bucks in one field, you know, open area, all green grass there. And they, they come there together to feed and then they, they spar or battle. So that tells you where she needs to be hunting bucks in September. And feeding areas where antler bucks and, and each square mile are feeding together and and sparring and battling. That's where you should be. Um, they aren't interested in ground scrapes and antler rubs yet. <laughs> that should tell you something. Now when you get close to the end of September, these battles become more and more serious and more extensive. And uh, you're going to see a picture here, if there's snow on the ground, because later, but this is uh, like two big, like the two biggest bucks in a, in a square mile coming together. And let's get this worked out here and just find out which of us is most dominant. And they all want to be most dominant. That, that's almost in the, their, their X genes to, to be most dominant because the most dominant buck established during this period becomes the one that's going to do all the breeding and that square mile. All the mature and yearling does that when they go into heat, they're going to be bred by that dominant buck, at least during those first two periods. By the, when they get to the third period, they're all going to have, all, all our deer will have moved out of their, their normal ranges and migrated to a wintering area. And you've got a whole bunch of deer out there. 
And usually by Christmas, around that time, the biggest bucks, the big dumb ones, boy, they wear themselves out, you know, all during the previous period to, for the, to keep the right to do all the breeding. And they got to fight and chase other bucks away quite commonly. And day and night patrol their ranges to keep other bucks away and to be handy when does are in heat, find them and that kind of thing. So they're worn out by that time. They can lose up to a third of their weight by mid-November. And they'll lose their antlers earliest. The first bucks to lose their antlers normally. And there's exceptions, but the first ones are usually those biggest bucks. And they'll lose them by, by Christmas, right around Christmas, 24th, 25th, 26th of December. And so by that time, they're in, the, they're in this wintering area, and there can be lots of deer there. And some some of these wintering areas are really large, miles and miles long. I, I know one there's usually 500, 600 deer in there every winter. And some wintering areas are small, and those are not as common, but there can be maybe a couple dozen deer in one wintering area. So they're different sizes. And it, it's dependent on the color that they provide and the food, the winter food, the browse that are available to those deer, or farm crops or farm residues. And, and because of that, uh, younger bucks will finally have an opportunity to breed, and that can be kind of hilarious. Uh, my, my wife and I, I, one day we were in a really large winter, lots of deer there, and all of a sudden we hear all this brush snapping and boy crackling, here comes a yearling doe running for her life with her ears back, and it was, uh, I don't remember, it was five, six bucks trailing, <laughs> and they're all racing with each other to get to that doe. That poor doe, it is her first breeding period. She'd probably been in nests before, but she hadn't been bred yet. And it was, you know, here it was around the first of the year, first of January. And she was eight. And uh, here they come, all these younger mucks chasing her. And I suppose one finally, finally had a chance to breed that doe. So. But most of them are bred, you know, all but about 5% before that even happens. It's kind of nature's way of making sure that the most fit of bucks does the breeding, which is good for whitetails. Now, global warming is changing now, <laughs> and that's not good. I'll talk about that some other time. But anyway, uh, but this is what's happening now. So after September, this these bucks meeting, in, now they can change feeding areas often, especially if there's hunter rounds like bow hunters, you know, uh, and feeding areas might be somebody's nice uh, food plot. <laughs> but uh, these older bucks are so good nowadays, you know, after 35 years of being hunted by, by tree standards, they, the older bucks get to be older bucks by being especially good at identifying hunters and trees before they're too near, to, before they're dangerously near. They're very good at it. And once they find them there, they just avoid them the rest of the hunting season. And uh, they don't necessarily leave there. It might seem like that, but they do because they'll keep 100 yards away, stay, you know, using cover to, to stay away from that hunter and that tree stand, so wherever it might be. But anyway, this, this phase of the rut, phase one, where they're battling to gain dominance and the right to breed, goes on until about mid October. Here in Minnesota, well, even in other states, uh, well, you get to a certain temperature. Here in Minnesota, the temperature that triggers the next phase of the rut is 32 degrees or colder at night. And we start getting our first frost at night, usually about mid-October. <laughs> Global warming is changing that, but I won't talk about that now. But anyway, at that time, then bucks start working to establish their own breeding ranges. And they all want a breeding range, and they all try to establish one themselves by marking them with scent and visual signposts known to us all as ground scrapes and antler rubs. That's what they, that's what those things are made, are for. Well, anyway, uh, but I'll talk about that another time now, but this is the beginning of phase one, and it's a long phase. I mean, it's a month and a half long. But um, 
if I was bull hunting this year, I might be, but I'm not sure yet. And I'll probably wait till later, like maybe in the first half of October sometime. But uh, when, when true leaves are down, and uh, so that kind of makes bucks stay in certain areas, they, you know, when the woods is full of leaves, they, they're free to move almost anywhere and stay concealed while they're doing it. But once the leaves are down, then they, then they're more obligated to stay to certain trails when they're moving on. So I like that. And then they start making ground scrapes in mid October, uh, in mid October, and that from that time on, I like to hunt so-called scrape routes. But that's another story. But anyway, this is an exciting time for bucks. Find a shed bell, and that starts in just a few days. And from that time, bucks are going to be much more mobile, moving over larger areas than they have all summer long, and kind of exciting for bucks and for hunters, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> if you know this about bucks. So that's the story of what's going on right now in your hunting area. Okay, now that's enough for today, guys, and before you leave, be sure to, be sure to subscribe. I really would appreciate it. That has everything to do with how long I can continue to give you all this good advice on on YouTube and also and poke that thumbs up button as well I appreciate that too and if you haven't got your book yet <laughs> uh, your 10th edition went to Hunter's Almanac all the stuff in there for ready refer during the hunting season I get letters all the time too guys tell me about how ragged their books are and they're all underlined and and uh, or covered with uh, colored markers and they even put tabs in so a quick reference to different areas if they want answers to a problem they're having hunting certain deer like big bucks. Uh, they're all in there. <laughs> I get letters from guys doing that. This is a book you don't just read once and put it on a shelf. This is a book you use every year for years and years and years. And especially it's going to be especially true of this one because the hunting methods you are going to learn are methods that older bucks just can't counter effectively. They can try, but the more they try, the more vulnerable they become, believe it or not. So, good book to have. You, you, you just kind of have this book, you guys. And uh, like I say, it doesn't cost much more than a lot of big game, a box of big game hunting cartridges. So, good investment for you. Well, thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.